Welcome to the Restoration Road, where my guests today to start a new teaching series on the Sermon on the Mount include Executive Director of Youth for Christ for more years than we can count, <laughs> all kinds of experience with youth, an amazing story that you can watch on the RestorationRoad.com, Larry Lee Lance. <laughs> Glad you're here. Good to be here. Good to be here. One of the most influential people in my life, 1983 NIT champion. Here we go. Play, go he dogs. lost his watch that he got. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say how. The bishop, the one and only senior pastor of Blackhawk Ministries, Kelly Bird. <laughs> it's not like it's a wow. re- WWF wrestling event. <laughs> <laughs> And that's Curtis. So anyway, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. The one and only chief meteorologist <laughs> on the ABC that. local affiliate in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and other affiliates. And <laughs> seen <laughs> around the world for every his trip affiliate to there... Israel. <laughs> Ladies and Ooh. gentlemen, the one, the only, Curtis Smith. Yeah. Your weatherman and mine. Guys, I, I brought you together today because I love you and I know you love God. And uh, we're going to start a series going through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has about 20,000 people around him, scholars say, and he's in uh, Capernaum. And uh, some say there's this amphitheater effect there. So everybody's hearing him. And he kicks it off with this literary device, uh, a Hebrew literary device called an inclusio. The inclusio is the first beatitude and the eighth beatitude, the last, are like bookends. And the clue on what this whole thing's about, like people would know this when they heard it, here's the main idea. So you take what's in the first and what's in the eighth, whatever's the same, whatever's the same in the first and the last, that's what this is about, and the listeners know it, and it's this, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven, um, as you all know, is God's divine reign, rule, and order in the hearts and lives of people on this earth now and in the future. So it's God's will for your life. And the series on the Beatitudes we're going to call the Satisfaction Through Surrender. Satisfaction Through Surrender. On each Beatitude, he's going to say who is satisfied. That's what blessed really means. He's going to say why they are satisfied. And then he's going to imply that they have to surrender the opposite. So it's going to be interesting as we walk through these and uh, illustrate and apply them from our own lives and see you know, what God reveals. So his very first thing he says is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit, you know, means humble. Um, humble means to make myself lower than. Uh, pride, the opposite, makes myself higher than. I become Lord or God in my own life, designer, restorer. Um, Poor in spirit is declaring my moral bankruptcy before a holy God. God, I can't pay this debt. God in Christ, you can. And it's interesting that that's the very beginning of the greatest speech ever given. The be, do, go of full surrender. Who you're designed to be determines what you're designed to do, which determines where you're designed to go. We think that life flows from the outside in. If I go somewhere and do something, then I'll be somebody. Mm -hmm. But Proverbs 4.23 says life comes from the inside out. So he, he kicks it off with saying, blessed are the humble, blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble. And that's who's satisfied. So satisfied are the humble. I want to ask you to think of someone who was humble and talk a little bit about what, what he or she was like. As you were talking about it, I immediately started thinking about my 18, 19 years here in the Fort Wayne community. Um, have had the privilege over all of my years to meet a number of people, individuals, leaders, who I felt like were extremely humble. I think in my years here, I don't think I've ever been around someone, spent time with someone, watched someone do ministry and leadership in a more humble way than a guy named Bob Yauberg. Mm. and, and if you, and some might not, but if you know Fort Wayne ministry history, there really wouldn't be anybody in, in the history, uh, you know, in the last 50 years who's been more influential, probably more impactful, uh, somebody who has influenced and discipled and walked alongside more of us in leadership, young and old. Bob mm-hmm. is just kind of the 
patriarch mm -hmm. of this whole deal. He really is. Yeah. He is. The investment that he makes in the life of a leader is powerful. Yeah. Um, he told me that he built Broadway Church by, and he would say God built it, by bringing everybody in groups of 12 through his home, mm -hmm. taking them through, I think, an eight-week small group course. Mm -hmm. And he said, I would always joke that that was my chair uh, that he would always sit in. And he said, by the eighth time, Mitchell, he said, I knew easily who the leader of that group was. And I'd say, this is your chair tonight. And then he blessed them to go and be a small group together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, they knew who the leader was. I said, man, that had to just really improve the relationships in your church. And he says, oh, they're so much more responsive to teaching. He said, it's just incredible what that does. I assume you've encountered Bob? Oh, yes, many times. And I thought of him. I thought of a couple of people locally. My pastor, Rick Hawks, oh, yeah. um, I put in that category. And the first one I thought of was uh, Sam Wagamuth. Mm. And I don't know. You know, how many would know Sam, but he was the international president of Youth for Christ for many years. And I had the privilege of serving on the National Board of Directors, and he was there. And he just made the decision to help mentor me as a young executive director. And I didn't know it till about two years in. Because all he would do is say, Larry, I want to take you to lunch after the meeting. And he would just sit there and listen. He would ask two or three questions, but he would just listen. And the more he listened, the more I poured my heart out. And it was never about him. And the one moment I remember most is he was down at Taylor University. We met halfway. We went to a restaurant. His wife, Grace, was with him. He came into the restaurant, and Grace stayed in the vehicle. And we had an hour conversation. At the end, I'm going, you know, what's, why is Grace... Well, he had told her it was important for her to read scripture and pray while we're meeting together because he wanted to have a real honest conversation about something. But I thought of Philippians 2. We studied it with our leadership team yesterday, you know, mm. the part that talks about mm -hmm. it's the interest of others mm -hmm. that you need to be concerned about, yeah. not mm -hmm. your own. And every time I was with Sam, I felt like I was the most important person in the world. Wow, that's good. And, and he just listened and encouraged never asked for a thing, n never talked about his own life. And he had many accomplishments. Uh, that was very impactful on me as a young leader in ministry. Let's think about what you guys just said. And Curtis, you hear all these adjectives coming out. Um, listener, um, takes initiative, uh, discipler, probably asks instead of tells. I think of this one guy I know, he was a, a main anchor at the first station I worked at. His name was Terry Caldwell. Great old newsman, chain smoking guy. <laughs> before, when you could smoke inside and before computers, he would sit there and bang on the typewriter. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think a Christian, uh, but just the nicest guy. And the thing about him, too, is he would do all of that. He would seek out young kids. I, I started there as a college kid worked there through graduation. And he would make you feel like you were an important part of the process. And what, what I was thinking too, to add to that is, even though he didn't have to, he had all the skill, all the talent, all the intelligence to just kind of throw you to the side and say, look, I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna get us through this process of getting the show ready. I know what to do. But he never did it that way. He always included everybody, mm -hmm. even the smallest people in the newsroom, the lowest paid, the the least important people in the newsroom were always included in the process because of his ability to reach out and bring everybody together as a team. So it wasn't just that he did it, it was that he did it when he really didn't need to. He, it would have been easier for him just to take over. Mm -hmm. And he never did it that way. Wow, see, humility and humanity both come from the same Latin word, humus, which means from the ground. We are literally made from the clay of the ground, and God breathed life into us, and he continues to inhale and exhale through us is something we miss in the original Hebrew, I guess. Um, we call it down to earth. He's down to earth. I'm convinced that in the Beatitudes, when Jesus says, blessed are the, satisfied are the, each one of these 
characteristics that we're going to talk about, each one of these heart conditions, they really flow from the inside out, uh, represent a heart condition of God. Um, when God had Moses on the mountain, um, he said, I'm going to tell you who I am. And one of the first words he chooses to describe himself is gracious, kanan in Hebrew, and it literally means to bend down or to stoop to one who is inferior. Uh, Jesus said, I'm humble in heart. So there's something in the heart of God on what we're talking about today that is so attractive Hmm. and how he draws us uh, to himself through the Holy Spirit. When I think about the people we're talking about and the characteristics that they have, like we said, listener, down to earth, takes initiative, inclusive, um, asks, doesn't really tell. Uh, There's something about that that's attractive it draws it doesn't like push can you um, tell me how you've experienced that in your own life as a leader where you said you know what Uh, maybe tell me the opposite (laughs) where you push somebody too hard or even as a parent Um, I think as a parent I go I have a tendency at times to go on autopilot and I kind of go into coach's mode Mm-hmm. And then I'll reflect. For some reason, God's made me that way. I reflect that on what I did later, and I'll think, eh, I could have modeled something a little bit better there. Uh, I could have valued my daughter better um, in the way I communicate. I could have modeled something that she'll catch because values are caught more than they're taught. And however I act in the home, they're going to act. And some people say whatever we do in moderation, our kids will do in excess. So I, I really have been thinking about that a lot. How about you, your dad, your leader? You ever ridden anybody too hard? Or? Never, Mitchell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kelly? <laughs> you know, I, I'm sitting here thinking of how you, you go to your default position. Mm-hmm. And whatever that is, call it sinful nature, call it flesh, call it just reality of, mm-hmm. you know, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic parents. That means something to me. Uh, that helps shape me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my dad used to always say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, suck it up and get it done. Yes. Well, that's ingrained in me. So yeah. then when you become a leader, and I was a coach and very competitive in athletics, and it's easy to go back to the default. And it's easy to just take charge and make statements. It takes too long to ask questions. It takes too long to engage and, and that's just that's my default and I have to guard against that as a leader every day. Bishop, how about you? Push too hard. Uh, I think yeah, me personally I think I would probably tend to in this discussion, I think when I look at me, I tend to like I like to um, I like to talk too much. I like to talk I think sometimes it's a gift, but oftentimes with me, I can go the other direction. I don't ask enough questions. Hmm. I survey situations real quick. I have answers real quick. I want to give direction real quick. And quite frankly, I can even tend to talk about me. I can talk about my family. I can talk, yeah, I I really am trying to work hard at learning to ask meaningful questions, listen longer, speak less. Um, And that's what I see in people when you talk about poor in spirit here at the outset of this thing. I just, whether it's Bob Yalberg, these guys that Larry and Curtis mentioned, others that are running through my mind, they just seem to not be about elevating themselves. They just seem to be about wanting to elevate others. And Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I got to keep working, keep working at it. You talk about Philippians 2. There's that picture of three circles getting closer together and it's my unselfish interests uh, the interests of others and then the interests of Christ of God in Christ and the more those you want to look for the sweet spot where those actually yeah. overlap and the more they come together mm. the more you're making decisions kind of in the mode that God wants you to with his heart um, I think a lot of times we miss that it's okay to look after your own unselfish interests you know it's you don't have to be a floor mat um, and these people who are humble or, that we're talking about were actually very bold. Mm-hmm. Sam and Bob, they were very There's bold. a strength to them. Yeah, huge strength. Absolutely. Which uh, ties into why they are satisfied. Mm-hmm. So they've humbled themselves to God. There's always an object to your humility. So they bend the knees of the heart to God, and they're satisfied because it's, 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 it's how they're designed, and they receive 
the kingdom of heaven. I think all through scripture we see, and I know we've experienced even in our lives, we've watched it play out. Uh, there is no, uh, I don't think, blessing, and there is no peace, and there is no opportunity um, shy of surrender. Hmm. Uh, I think that is the central message of the Son of God. And when we're willing to come to the end of ourselves, when we're really willing to take that posture of humility and surrender, then and only then do we get to experience the blessings and all that God has for us, as you said earlier today, and even even in the future. But he is opposed to the proud. Mm -hmm. And I think if you just stop and think about mm -hmm. that, just for a moment, that God, the God of the universe is against, he is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble, it's just the beginning of all that God has for us, and without it, we miss all that God has for us. Proverbs 3.34, and James quotes it, Peter quotes, quotes it. It's it. a yep. serious mm -hmm. deal to them, and Jesus is, in essence, is, is, is saying that. Um, it's a strong word. God takes opposition against. I mean, he, yeah. he's, he's drawn a line in the sand against yeah. pride, yep. and it's because it's, it's we're designed to be different. Right. The humility and the pride, they're so far apart, I get stuck in the middle. Um, you know, leadership is hard and you have to lead people, you know, so there has to be some air of confidence. Um, there has to be some marketing of what you do. Mm -hmm. there, there has to be Boldness. all these things that, that yeah, that the, the world says you have to do to be successful. Yes. And so that gray area of how do you do that with the right spirit I'm sitting here thinking of uh, Proverbs 1, 3, living a prudent and disciplined life, doing what is right and just and fair. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've always thought, boy, that right, just and fair part, if I just get that, I'm going to have a pretty good life. Mm -hmm. um, how it translates to kids, I mean, a lot of the kids we deal with, especially at the inner city, they, you know, their gods are athletes and people that they see doing some pretty crazy stuff, not mm -hmm. a whole lot of humility, mm -hmm. um, a lot of arrogance, a lot of pride, a lot of me, me, me. And we're always having to break through that with the teens of trying to help them understand that it's, you know, Jesus said he came, he, he gave himself, mm -hmm. he gave, you know, um, trying to help them understand that it's not about me. And so all we can do as ministry people with kids is let our light shine. I mean, words are important, but actions are huge. Mm -hmm. And so when we're interacting with kids on a regular basis and we're rubbing shoulders and we're in the gym and something fight breaks, I mean, how you respond and how you treat people um, is huge. So I think that's the secret, especially with young people, is they've just got to see it in your life because words are sort of meaningless mm -hmm. at times. They've, they've heard it all before. Again, that made me think of Philippians 2, the kenosis passage. There's an emptying of self, he referenced, that, yeah. that God does. He didn't, Jesus didn't come and consider equality with God as something to be grasped, to be white-knuckled. Gave it away. He came down, and, and it's this, uh, Philippians 2 is this uh, chiasmus. It's a literary um, pendulum. So it starts at the top, which is God, and he comes down, comes down, goes down in the words, and then he gets him even down to earth to death, even mm. death on a cross. And then the pendulum comes up the other side, and then it leads you to he's even going to be exalted above all other names. Um, but Curtis, uh, again, you mentioned it early. Um, our lives, uh, mine lately, have been in in ministry, around hanging around Christian people, trying to evangelize other people. What's the kingdom of heaven look like for a weatherman uh, in a new station? Uh, well, sunny all the time. I was right? going to say, it's not always sunny in yeah. 75. Uh, yeah. There's a low front making its, <laughs> making its way in. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I work, yeah. It's, I, um, it can be difficult. The newsroom is an interesting place. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big room that isn't really separated much. There aren't cubicles and offices, and so you have a big melting pot of people from all different walks of life and backgrounds. And uh, Yeah, you can stand out as a Christian rather than be one of the masses. You kind of can stand out. 
I think your humility um, is very much a part of how God used you to be on a uh, network affiliate newscast and go to Israel and read the Bible on the air and talk about your own faith. I mean, that is an amazing thing. Mm. I, I think it's one of the most amazing things that ever happened in the media. Uh, it is, because I have absolutely no idea how it happened. Even I remember sitting in meetings where I could see that it was happening, thinking, how in the world is this happening? <laughs> I have mm. no idea mm. how God is doing this. I was sitting there in a meeting with our news director, who's not a Christian, and this idea is getting pitched of me going to Israel and showing people where Jesus walked and everything. And he said, there's something our viewers don't know about Curtis. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh, no, what is he going to say? I mean, you know, like, <laughs> and he says, Curtis has a faith that he can actually share with our viewers here. This is a chance for him to share <laughs> what he believes. And I remember looking, I'm like, <laughs> you, what's going on here? <laughs> Am I having a oh, dream? Yeah. Someone pinch me? Oh, I, yeah. yeah. And I guess it's a testament to trying to just live out your faith every day, mm -hmm. kind of in a quiet way. And in a way, you just end up standing out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just by being, trying to be humble. And, mm -hmm. and it's a struggle. Larry was just talking about kids. And I was thinking in my own house, it's a struggle to get them to not be so me-centered. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even, even growing up in a Christian home, our, our kids struggle with that. And then I think about myself, I struggle with that. I feel like a lot of what I do through my daily life is really all about me. What, what can I get out of this? You know, what do I want here? And that's what's applauded in our culture. It is, it's very easy to, to be that way. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, when I hear, I've heard that story a few times, and whenever I hear that story, I think about the, the reward and the blessing that God gave throughout the scriptures, that God gave to humble people who followed him graciously. I think about Daniel. I think about Joseph. I think about Esther. I think about Nehemiah mm. with these kings and these governments and these rulers, how they got unspeakable opportunity to do unbelievable things. And I think it was born out of their faithfulness and their humility mm -hmm. and their kindness and their steadiness. And um, yeah, it's really a, a great example of that. When I did an in-depth study for the first time of the kings of Israel and Judah, uh, it just bounced off the pages at me that they were judged on whether they were humble or proud toward God. That's what the writers are choosing to tell mm -hmm. you how they're judged. So every leader is going to be, be judged that way with God. So how do we uh, do this? We, we got who is satisfied is the humble. Why are they satisfied? They, uh, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, experience God's will in their lives. But how are they satisfied and implied? We need to surrender our pride. How, uh, how are you going to apply a poor in spirit inventory? Uh, think about going through your lives right now. I'm thinking about it too. And where does pride show up? I find it very easy to be arrogant with other people. Mm -hmm. I think I'm smarter. I think I know what I'm doing better. I don't need anyone to help me. Those attitudes are very easy to have. The Celtics are better than the Lakers. Now that's just fact. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let me, let me prove uh -oh. this real Take easy. Oh my God. You see how Kelly handles his you pride You tell right me, now. which yeah. number is higher? 17 or 16? <laughs> Which number is higher? Is that number of championships? That is number of championships. So yeah, that's, but that's just very goes, easy. Yeah, but those numbers include, he goes back to when they wore like <laughs> shorts up to their groins and, <laughs> and played with leather, leather, balls, leather balls and baskets and, and it smoked cigars on the bench. And I mean, that, it's a different, <laughs> yeah, that's right. whatever. Every year when they beat the Lakers in the finals. Yeah. Uh, oh. Like five of their championships were won in Minneapolis. <laughs> when George, Mike, and you talk about short Any, shorts. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not really pride. In the I'm not sure what just happened right <laughs> there. No. They're just talking about pride that's, of a team. That's, that's different, just, right? Okay, right? maybe, maybe. That's just, I am confused. Well, that's, just, <laughs> that's just ignorance. I so think we'll Jesus <laughs> wants it everywhere. <laughs> oh, um, Poor in spirit inventory. You're, you're, that's good. We, it, it, God does warrant it in our minds, but then we don't want to uh, live it out with people. But I think God repeatedly communicates through the writers of Scripture that 
if you humble yourself to him, you are gonna humble yourself to other people. Yeah. For me, no greater opportunity for humility than to say to, you name it, wife, kids, coworkers, friends, I was wrong. Mm. Please forgive me. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I handled that, the way I said that, um, to say to someone, I really need your forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, what I did there was wrong. You know, when I hear people say things about our organization or our people or things that are being accomplished and goals and objectives, and it's just like, wow, just look at all the good stuff that's happening. And you get a little puffed up going, all right, we're doing the right stuff. I hired good people. You know, our strategy's really working. And the PR and marketing's working. I mean, all of that. And it's, it's hard for me to not take that and go. It is hard to deflect praise. I remember listening to Mother Teresa, I didn't know her personally, but listening to her once say, when she received all of that, she simply said, thank you very much, I appreciate it. But she then made note that what she did every night is got on her knees, and before she closed her eyes, she gave that all back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, she said, I know it all comes from you, I mm -hmm. give it all back to you. She did that in private. Mm -hmm. And I, that always stuck with me that that's mm -hmm. probably a good way and I try to practice mm -hmm. that. That is excellent. That's yeah. good. Well, what about you? Are you ready to take a poor in spirit inventory? Ask the Holy Spirit to just examine your heart and reveal any pride. And it's probably manifesting itself in a relationship. Whether it's an addiction to a substance, it's still probably manifesting itself, your pride, my pride, in a relationship. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what you need to surrender and yours will be the kingdom of heaven. Today might be the day that you draw a line in the sand, put a stake in the ground, and fully surrender your heart to Christ as Savior and Lord, and the abundant and eternal life, His design for you, will take place today. If you surrender your life to Christ, please visit therestorationroad.com and share your story with us. Thank you so much for being with us today. You can get your worksheet on our website and use this in your small group if you're willing to bring us into that special place. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Curtis? Yeah. Wait a minute, Curtis, Larry mentioned his senior pastor. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> no. I think I've said all I need to about that. <laughs> mm.